In the middle of the excitement and joy of the Christmas season, we have come together today for an important occasion, to mark the Day of the Innocents, remembering the old story of how King Herod had ordered the death of innocent children in his attempt to kill the baby Jesus. But we're not here today just to relive ancient history, because today we use this occasion to remember that even though we now live in safety and in peace, there are still too many children around this city, around this world, that live in danger and are placed in danger every day. They look to God and they look to us for compassion and care. Let's begin by listening to the ancient story. Innocent scriptures from Gospel Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 18. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. During the reign of King Herod, about that time, some wise men from eastern lands <coughs> arrived in Jerusalem, asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are not listed among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, Come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and so the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gift of gold, frank incense, and myrrh. When it was time to live, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to jo Joseph in a dream. Get up, leave to Egypt. With the child and his mother, the angel said, stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophets. I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he, furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. Based on the wise men's report of the star first appearance, Harold's brutal action fulfilled that God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and a great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. Amen. Jesus wasn't born into a perfect world, but into a world full of serious problems and serious dangers. 
This is something that we often lose sight of in the joyfulness of the Christmas season. But it's something that the Bible writers didn't want us to forget. That original Christmas didn't happen in a perfect fairy tale place. Instead, Jesus was born into our world, a world stained by unfairness, danger, and violence, a world full of rejection and hate. God comes into his own world only to be met by hostility and aggression. God comes into the world to be with us in a humble, vulnerable, and weak way, in the form of a helpless child. And with his very first breath, he finds himself already an outsider and in danger. As John chapter 1 verses 10 to 11 tell us, he came into the very world that he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. In Jesus, God enters the world. He comes to be here with us and to share our ordinary human lives and our experiences. And that's good news. In Jesus, God's love and grace enter the world. But that's not to say that the world welcomes that love. There are forces that push back. The world doesn't roll out the red carpet and greet God with open arms. Instead, God in his love entered into this world and the world did its very best to throw God back out again. And the world used every means possible, including hatred, violence, and death, to push back against God, not caring who got hurt or killed along the way. So today we pause in our happy Christmas celebrations to remember that not everyone in our world welcomes goodness and love with open arms, and that some will push hard hard against it, and do everything in their power to destroy it, even if that means hurting and killing the innocent. At Christmas time, God comes into his world, but not everyone is happy to have God here with us. In a little child, in the baby Jesus, light and hope entered our dark world. There were many in the world who did their best to block out that light. And today there are still many who will do what they can to destroy hope and life and to hurt those who are weaker. But in the brokenness of this world, there is good news because God promises us that those forces that work for hatred, those forces that work for evil and death can never win because Christ is already the winner. He will wipe away all tears. He will put an end to injustice. And he shows us that fairness life and love will win. He invites us to join him in working for fairness and life and to cooperate together with him in caring for those in danger and need. And that's our special theme for this service today. Let's pray together. Loving God, in Jesus, in a little child, you joined us in this world. You joined us in all of our weakness and vulnerability. And even though many pushed back against that love that you brought, you've shown us that evil and hatred will never win. Make us active instruments of your love today. Help us to become lights of compassion in our own society, to cooperate with those around us, to comfort those who mourn for lost children, and to stand up for all of those children around us who continue to live in situations of injustice danger, and need today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our hymn for this day of innocence, by gracious powers so wonderfully sheltered. with us night and morning. 
Revelation 12, 1 through 6a and 21, 1 through 5. Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Then I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, with seven crowns on his head. His tail swept away one-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. She gave birth to a son who was to rule all nations with an iron rod. 
and her child was snatched away from the dragon and was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from, the, from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home and now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are, go are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making all things new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. Amen. Amen. Today's sermon titled Hope for Our Future will be delivered by Pastor Stephen Locke. The grace and peace of Christ be with us all today. No matter which country we go to, no matter which culture we find ourselves in, I think parents everywhere will say that they love their children. In principle, it's natural for parents to love their children. In principle, it's universal. It's expected. In principle, it's something that unites us all as human beings, that we all share this love for our children. In principle, it would even be crazy just to doubt that parents have this love for their kids. If we stop people on the street and just ask them, excuse me, do you love your children? People would look at us like we were insane. What kind of question is that to ask? In principle, of course, of course parents love their children. The problem is just that in practice, in practice things don't always work out that way. In practice, not every child is loved. In practice, not every child is cared for. Not every child is valued. On the street, older generations all immediately say that they love their children. But if we actually asked the younger generations themselves, too many would say that in our current society, they don't feel particularly loved. They don't feel particularly valued at all. How many times over the last few years in Taiwan have young people heard the elders criticize them as the so-called strawberry generation, as being too soft, as being not tough enough, not resilient enough, not willing to put up with the hardships and the troubles that the older generations went through. And we can understand the confusion of young people when they wonder, isn't that the point? Isn't that the whole point of life? Isn't it the point of life and history to improve the world so that children can suffer less than their parents did? What kind of strange attitude do parents and grandparents have when they demand that their children should go through the same sufferings and hardships they did? And again, in principle, it's universal that parents care for their children and their children's future. And yet all around the world, we've seen young people join the Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion movements because they feel their futures aren't being cared for very well at all. We say we love our children, but then instead of leaving the next generation a, a healthy, a sustainable, a livable world, we selfishly use up all the world's resources for ourselves now. We pollute the world now. We damage and heat it now. And we leave a dying mess for the children to come. We see this conflict and contradiction between our words and our actions. We talk about love for our children, but so much of what we do hurts the young, hurts the future, and takes advantage of the young for our own gain. Before we think that this is a modern problem, a problem of the modern world, the Bible shows us that none of this behavior is particularly new. All through history, individuals and societies have wanted to develop, have wanted to advance, they've wanted to prosper. And all through history, children have been the first to pay the price for their parents' gains. When we read through the Bible, we find some scary examples. We read through the Bible and we find that for centuries, the ancient Israelites participated in human sacrifices, sacrificing their own children 
to all kinds of idols and false gods. And they did it in the hope of getting a better harvest, a greater blessing, a richer and more comfortable life. Today we look back on those ancient stories of child sacrifices, of sto- stories of foolishness, stories of horror. But somehow not much has changed. Somehow children are still the first to be sacrificed to the false gods of our modern world too. The only difference is that our modern idols aren't made of metal or stone. Instead, today we sacrifice our children to false gods like the economy. We throw them into an economic system that destroys them with pressure and overwork, with low incomes and the hopelessness of high debt. We sacrifice some to poverty so that others can live well. We sacrifice our children to the false god of nationalism. We place our children into the arms of the gods of war. We send them off to the military to sacrifice their lives for our countries. And we sacrifice them to the political system too. Our politicians tell us over and over that some have to sacrifice, some have to suffer, so that others can maintain the life that they prefer. Some have to suffer for our political parties to stay in power. Today, economic, military, and political power all want to be fed with sacrifices. And children are still the first to get offered up. And while all through history people have been willing to sacrifice their own children, those decisions have always been easier when it involved sacrificing someone else's kids instead especially the children of the poor and weak. And that's the core theme that runs through our Bible readings today. Our scriptures today highlight the way that destructive powers are so willing to support themselves by harming and devouring other people's children. We saw that first in the way that King Herod tried to kill Jesus. Herod is called a king, but the title is actually a strange one. Herod was allowed to play at being king in Judea, not because he was born into it or not because the people particularly wanted him, but because the Roman Empire had put him into that position. In the time of Jesus, it was the Roman Empire that ruled over Judea and over the Mediterranean world. And since the emperor in Rome needed a loyal person to rule Judea for him, Herod was chosen. Not because Herod would care for the people, but because Herod would serve the empire and control the people of Judea. And as long as Herod did that, as long as Herod could manage to keep that going, then he could keep calling himself king. But the people in Judea dreamt of a true king. Someone who would defend them, someone who would stand up for them and their needs. Which is why in the decades... Before Jesus' birth, there had been one violent revolution after another, one attempt after another to find a better leader, a true leader, a true, wise, loving person to lead the people. So the sudden news from the wise men that this new king of the Jews had been born represented a real political threat to Herod, a threat to his power, a threat to his position and his control. To protect his power... King Herod turns to mass killings as his solution. And somehow I feel our modern world hasn't really progressed very far beyond that. In too many countries today, we see political leaders still protecting their position and their power with this same approach. From Turkey to Russia, from Congo to Myanmar, and even in our so-called advanced Western countries, We see leaders attacking others, caging and killing the weak to keep a hold on to power. And what's worse is that they do it in such an easy way, such a couldn't care less, such an unconcerned way. We watch as Herod, in his attempt to defend his power and political position, immediately, immediately gives the order to kill all the young boys in and around Bethlehem. There's no great moral dilemma for him here. Herod doesn't wrestle with his conscience. He doesn't nervously wring his hands or suffer under the guilt of this decision. Herod couldn't care less. 
Herod couldn't care less about this order to kill, and he shows no hesitation in it at all. And honestly, in his position, why should he care? It's his political interests. It's in his political interests to hold on to power. So what does it matter to him if some poor children, someone else's poor children, have to suffer and die for that to happen? And Herod knows he won't have to face any serious repercussions for that decision. After all, it's not like the families of the poor and the weak can do anything to stop him. The king gives the order. His soldiers go and kill And as Matthew 2.18 tells us, the only thing the mothers and fathers of Bethlehem can do is cry. Cry over the slaughtered bodies, the bodies of their slaughtered children. And again, sadly, Herod's actions aren't unique. If we look backwards into history, this story about the slaughter of the innocent children of Bethlehem echoes a similar and much older story in our Bibles. In the story of the Exodus, we see that when the Hebrews were slaves in Egypt, the Egyptian pharaoh also felt that these foreigners in his land were putting his political power at risk. Pharaoh's response, like Herod's, was simply to solve this problem by ordering the killing of all the baby Hebrew boys. Because again, in the eyes of power, when it comes to protecting that power, the death of other people's children is a small price to pay. And then if we look forwards, if we look forwards into history, we find that today very little has changed. Large world powers, even here next door to us in Asia, still feel free to kill, oppress, and do whatever injustice they want to those who are weaker, knowing that the weak can do so very little about it. And we see this same unconcerned and destructive abuse of power in our readings from Revelation. I have to say that in church we don't often read these texts from Revelation because Revelation is an incredibly complex text full of lots of strange symbolism and confusing imagery. But there's a good reason why it's so confusing. Revelation was written in the decades after Jesus when Christians were being persecuted, arrested and killed by the Roman Empire. And so instead of taking the risk of speaking freely, Instead of taking the risk of writing clearly, John wrote the text of Revelation in code and symbols, describing the power and violence of Rome in a secretive way that only other Christians could understand. The city of Rome, with its many rulers, was built on seven hills. And so in Revelation 12, John talks about Rome in this coded way as a violent dragon with seven heads and crowns stretching its power out across the region. And the dragon of Rome will also do whatever is needed to hold on to its power. In this coded way, in this secret way, John describes the hope that oppressed Christians had, a hope for a savior, a hope for a child, a hope for a son, for someone who would be born to save people from their suffering and to rule over this world with justice and power to set this world right, to set this world in order. And John also describes the way that the dragon Rome would try its hardest, just like Herod did, to kill that child, to kill that new hope in its attempt to hold on to power. But while in these texts John is describing Rome, the book of Revelation isn't just a critique of the abuses of the Roman Empire alone. As if in the history of the world, the Roman Empire was the only one to abuse its power. No. Revelation's reminder is that this danger is something that we'll always face in every generation. In every generation, in every age of history, we're always going to have this issue. We're always going to have this hope for change, this hope for fairness, this longing that hope will be born into our lives, into our society, into our world. But the problem is that the nations, the empires, the dragons of power that rule over this world will also do anything they can to kill such a hope, to stop any threat to their power. Political power wants to survive. And if that means that children need to be devoured and killed for that to happen, then that's what political powers will do. 
military and economic powers want to keep their rule. And if that can only happen by eating up the lives of the poor and the powerless, then those powers won't hesitate to do that either. That's the horrific truth about power in our world. The truth that Revelation wants to open our eyes to. It wasn't just ancient Rome that acted that way. It wasn't just ancient Rome that disregarded the lives and suffering of the weak. All violent powers will do that. All violent powers will be tempted, will be lured to do that, to devour the weak. Revelation teaches us that there are three certainties, three certainties that we can count on in our world. The first certainty is that violent powers will always face the temptation to hold on to their power by hurting and oppressing the weak. The abuses of the ancient Roman Empire weren't unique in any way. They were just one example of a constant problem. The history of the world is the history of the way that the strong have oppressed the weak and abused them, whether that was in ancient Egypt or ancient Rome or any of the other ancient world powers. In every corner of the world today, we still see this going on. We still see the way that nations grab and hold on to power and carelessly hurt and oppress the weak. At the moment, we hear many of our friends in Hong Kong describe this as their daily experience right now. But again, this isn't unique. Revelation presents this to us as a universal truth, as a certainty that unjust powers, like Pharaoh, like Herod, like Caesar before them, unjust powers will always face the temptation of killing and oppressing the weak, including thousands of innocents and children. And they'll do this to keep hold of their rule. But the second certainty, the second certainty Revelation teaches us is that these world powers that hurt and kill the weak for their own gain never seem to understand that this approach will fail. To protect his empire's power, Egypt's pharaoh slaughtered the Hebrew children. And yet the Egyptian empire still collapsed. The Egyptians used violence to rule, and when they failed, other, other empires thought, well, it must be their turn now to try the same thing. After the Egyptians failed, the Babylonians thought now it was their time to rule. And so with violence and terror, they too oppressed and killed the weak, and they too failed. And after Babylon, we saw empire after empire, each one take their turn. Persia, Assyria, Greece, Rome, they all thought they could succeed. They all thought they could make this win. They, they could succeed where the last empire had failed. They thought they, could make, they thought they could make it. They could be the ones to make violence and oppression work and to support their empires forever in this way. And yet every last one of them collapsed. Not one of them learned that this was the way of failure. And we watch the news today and we still see this going on. We still see this mentality. We watch the news today and we see countless nations around us who still haven't learnt this lesson. Nations who still try to influence and rule the world with violence, killing the weak, oppressing the poor, filling refugee camps with their victims, destroying their own people and others, and not realising that they too, like every other empire in history, will also fail. All through history, all the so-called great nations and empires have used power and violence to kill and rob and oppress others and to carelessly kill countless innocents. And all through history, every single one of them has failed. Not a single one has lasted. Because God's message through Scripture is that the way of violence and injustice and hurtfulness can only ever end in failure. It's not the pathway to success. The answer to violence and abuse is also never more violence and abuse in return. All through history, there's only ever been one kingdom that succeeded and that's continued undefeated to survive. And that's the true kingdom of Christ, a kingdom built on love, not a kingdom built on violence. And that leads us to the last to the final certainty. 
This third certainty that Revelation teaches us is the greatest of all. It's the certainty that God does indeed see the suffering of those who are oppressed. God does indeed hear their prayers, and God will certainly come to save them. The message of the book of Revelation isn't pessimism. That's not what it's trying to teach us. It's not trying to tell us that we should be depressed or in despair at the terrible way that worldly powers abuse their power. Instead, the message is quite the opposite. It's the good news that even though worldly powers think that they have this power and control, that they think they have the might to control and hurt and destroy, God's power is even greater. And God's promise in Revelation 21 is that he will come and set things right. He will come and put an end to all of the injustice and suffering that we see around us. And God will come and make all things new again. God sees the injustice happening in our world and God himself will come to wipe away every tear and bring us comfort. God sees the abuse that's happening in this world and God will put an end to evil and injustice, to corruption, put an end to this carefree abuse of the weak by the strong. God's power is greater and God promises, promises that there will be an end to killing, there will be an end to sorrow, an end to crying and pain. As Revelation 21.4 promises us, all those things will be gone forever. God's promise is that he is making all things new. God's love will flood out over this whole creation, transforming everything that it touches, doing away with all sin and abuse and evil and healing all things. I know that in the darkness of our, of our world, in the darkness of our troubles, these words sound almost too amazing. In the brokenness of our very unfair world, a world where the innocent are suffering, those words sound too good to be true. But in Scripture, God turns to John and commands him, write this down. Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. It's the final certainty. All of us stand now at the end of another year. Another year where we've watched power be abused to hurt and kill. In every corner of the world, in the West, in the Middle East, in Africa, in the Pacific, and here in Asia too, we've watched the way that so many nations abuse their power to hurt the weak and the innocent. But the good news is that that abuse of power is not the end. That's not the end. All earthly empires will end. All evil will end. Only the power of God's love will continue forever. And so the good news for our future and for this new year is that fairness is coming, that freedom is coming, that love is coming. Because God is coming, and his power is greater than all of the unfairness that this world can contain. And even more, the good news is that we don't have to wait for that very far off final day imagined by Revelation to see these changes already taking place in our world. We can see that new hope now. We can see it now when we look around us. We can see it now because when we stand together against unfairness, we stand together with God in changing this world. When we stand together against all of these evils and problems, we share in God's work. When we stand together against violence and abuse, we cooperate with God. And when we speak out against the hurting of innocence, wherever and whoever they may be, we stand side by side with the God who loves us and who cares for us all. Today, each of us already has the chance to be symbols of hope and love in our community and our world. We have that chance. We have that opportunity. And we can be brave enough to do this. We can be brave enough to stand up for love. We can be brave enough because we have God's promise and God's certainty that it's the work of love that finally wins. Let's pray together. Loving God, 
You weren't born in a palace, but in a stall in Bethlehem. You were weak and exposed, endangered and vulnerable. But in your gentleness, you showed us real power. You showed us real goodness and real love. Your love always goes out to the vulnerable and to the hurting. And your good news is a message that brings all of us new hope. Help, help us. Help us in the coming new year to hold on to that hope. Help us to be your disciples in this world, to reject the arguments that promote hate. Help us to stand against the powers that see the death and suffering of innocence as acceptable. Give us the courage to follow you in caring for the weak and vulnerable. We are all your precious children, and it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.